ஹலோ சார் ஹலோ சார் சந்திரமொழி சார் ஹலோ சார் ஹலோ சார் சவுண்ட் பர்த்தே சார் ஆ பர்த்தே ஆ ஓகே ஓகே சார் தேங்க்யூ கண்டினியூ சார் am i audible sir uh, chandra mauli sir yes please ah uh, okay sir one two minutes sir they are joining students are joining ah uh, I need to check my camera. Okay, sir. very good afternoon and warm welcome to the guest lecture on theory of elasticity it's my great honor to take an opportunity to introduce one of our guest of the day he is none other than dr chandra mauli sv is the professor department of civil engineering vs university bangalore chandra mauli sir has he has been honored as a best professor in civil engineering studies at the 27th devang mehta business school award 2019 and sir has more than 18 plus year industry experience and national conference 18 plus international poll and magazine articles a and invited talks 20 plus external guide for mtech students 20 plus and training interns and 40 plus it's our pleasure to have you sir on behalf of mechanical department department of mechanical engineering ps university welcome you sir for this guest lecture and over to you sir thank you uh, for the kind uh, invite uh, i must be thankful that uh, the inter department uh, presentations or the guest lectures are going to be a, a, a platform for knowledge sharing as well as knowing the uh, each department and their skill sets in this way uh, i think uh, this is going to be a very good uh, session wherein uh, i'll be learning much uh, rather than teaching because as a teacher when we teach actually we are learning more so i thank you uh, for the kind invite uh, to all the organizing team and as well as the department of mechanical engineering and on behalf of my department or uh, department of civil engineering i uh, i extend my best wishes to the department and i wish uh, extend my best wishes for the next coming uh, isa as well as esa for the, all the candidates who are listening to this particular lecture so today's uh, my topic uh, is uh, invited talk and on uh, euler's uh, column buckling load introduction and concept uh, i believe that the uh, the guests or uh, the invitees would excuse me if in case uh, i am not well prepared for today because of the other activities but uh, definitely uh, there will be a lot of things that you will take back home now before i start i would like to thank to all my teachers which i do uh, every time i um, been invited as a guest uh, speaker or a keynote lectures because whatever i am today it is because of their uh, you know uh, training i must acknowledge to all my teachers for their contributions to what i am today so i also believe in one thing uh, that is when the student is ready the guru will definitely appear 
this uh, should be the note that everybody should know when you are knowledgeable definitely you will uh, reach the success so similarly when the student is ready the guru will appear irrespective uh, whether uh, you go seek for it or seek for him or not definitely it will reach you and uh, being a teacher or being anyone being successful you should know one thing in mind irrespective to what uh, achievements you have achieved you should always revert to your teachers for but because of whom uh, you are most successful today so the great adi shankar acharya um, uh, was the person you know he he happened to uh, write the uh, guru ashtakam okay so he is uh, revered was one of the best gurus uh, but still he always emphasized on the importance of guru so uh, i would always start my uh, uh, any lectures with the guru ashtakam saying that if you don't revert to your teacher uh, there is no point that is he says that if you don't revert to your teacher or you don't uh, revert to your uh, the master then what is the use what is the use and what is the use so i would always start with revering to all my teachers including the students who have taught me a big lesson and uh, uh, the other uh, experiences i had at various uh, institutes who have been a uh, teacher to me so let's start with today's uh, lectures just to start with and just just to increase my fluidity to talk because uh, of the unpreparedness so i have included few of the basic things that needs to be learned uh, uh, from the engineering point of view uh, the as you all know the task of the safe design of engineering components or you call it as members as well as the system itself the overall system is to ensure that the components have sufficient strength rigidity uh, that is also uh, in terms of stiffness and the stability these are the three components or the three main pillars of any safe design now what do you mean by safe engineering design is that the system should be optimal or it should be functional and the functional should be optimal so whether you design any structure but you need to design it in such a way that it performs optimal any change in the system's behavior whether it is uh, whether it is not functioning rightly or it is not functioning to the optimal then it is called as uh, unsafe design or the failed designs so basically there is a requirement for a safe design and that's the engineering concept that needs to be put into and these engineering concepts are got from the basics the three main pillars are the strength the stiffness and the stability so this you have learned and these are the definition that you should know the strength the ability of the component or the part to resist damage so it could be damage is uh, defined here as a fracture but not necessary if you have to look into the depth of the things that the damage is nothing but a change of a state if in case you have some uh, material over a period of time you subject that to a temperature it undergoes a lot of changes within the body in simple language and thereby it, there is a change in the uh, the performance of it or there could be some type of change in its behavior so there me that means that there is a change of its state from before and after so that could be also considered as a damage so here we are just giving an example as fracture or a significant deformation under the influence of external loads so the strength is the ability or uh, sometimes the some people talk in terms of resistance but anyway that is also an ability now uh, the strength is a parameter that reflects the failure of the material so basically the when you apply a load onto a structure let's say you are going to apply some load p onto a structure it is going to be spread on an area that area is always under the stress so basically because of the stress there should be some type of uh, you know reactions because of the stress itself is internal forces because of that there could be some changes in the material's behavior so that also could reflect the something to, uh, some characteristics of the strength of the material so generally when we talk about strength uh, since i am from the civil background and the structural background uh, closely related to mechanical engineering i think my words and the, the today's topic topic will be also um, uh, in if in case i use some uh, civil engineering terms i think uh, you try to replace that with your uh, own mechanical uh, engineering terms if in case you find uh, i use some terms that is related to civil engineering so strength generally includes the tensile strength the compressive strength okay so whenever we are talking about damage so either these any of these stresses or the strengths 
or being uh, crossed a threshold value or crossed a limit of that particular material to resist or the ability of the material. So that could be called as damage and the stress is always uh, represented by uh, the newtons per millimeter square. In the, I mean, it should be in a consistent unit and I think you are more comfortable with the MPA, the SI units, the megapascals, so MA, uh, megapascals, wherein Pascal is nothing but newton per uh, meter square. That's the unit. So whenever the, you are talking about the strength, you also expect a failure because you know that the, the, the strength is going to be sometimes the material won't withstand. You will have two type of failures or basically you have various types, but I will, uh, I've just included these two. That is brittle fa failures and the plastic yielding. So brittle failure, as you know, this happens. Uh, brittle fracture happens when the material is not able to deform or it doesn't deform as much as we expect, but it, it has a minimum uh, a marginal or negligible deformation wherein it looks like a sudden break. Uh, so that is a sudden fracture that occurs without any significant uh, plastic deformation. So the well, what we have to know is the significant uh, plastic deformation is that uh, that is what I wanted to highlight. Though we say it is a uh, brittle failure, the plastic deformation that you see in such a material will be not that significant. So that will be as minute as possible. So then the plastic yield, the, that means the material can uh, undergo plastic deformation. So the, when the material can undergo plastic deformation uh, post its uh, point of uh, uh, some certain point, then it is called the material set to be in plastic yielding. So now the, you would have learned about the strength theories. Now in the strength theory, you would have learned about uh, the theory of maximum tensile stress and the maximum tensile strain theory, theory of maximum shear stress, shape change specific energy theorem. So these are the theories that you would have learned. Now uh, the theory of maximum tensile stress, if it is, you just have to brush it up, uh, that you should know that as soon as the uh, maximum tensile uh, stress, if in case you represent by sigma, at a point inside the member reaches an ultimate stress in any unidirection, when you subject a material into unidirectional stress uh, conditions, the material will undergo the uh, fracture failure. So the, you would uh, see that the fracture failure is because of the brittle nature. So this condition for the brittle failure of the component uh, is a dangerous, I mean, it's, it is a point at which, you know, beyond which it is uh, com completely, the, comp the whole system is going to fail, thereby it is called as a danger point. So you would have learned uh, these details earlier. And uh, again, you know, you would have learned about the strain theory. That means when a material is going to be strained and it reaches uh, to a certain point when it is subjected to you, only direction then you, you would have understood how the failure would have taken place and you had the you would have applied the generalized Hooke's law and got the formulas and then you would have also learned about when you know the direct stresses and uh, all the other stresses that is involved then you will also uh, read the uh, study about the theory of maximum shear stresses okay so then when you know that when a body is being subjected to various uh, uh, type of uh, the stresses and uh, various uh, strains, then you know there is a change of the shape. So that thereby you will understand uh, the, something about the shape change specific energy theorem. These are the theorems that you shall learn uh, uh, when, it, uh, when it is related to the strength. Basically, we are talking about the, the three components of uh, the any safe design that is going to be strength and then the stiffness and the stability. The second parameter is the stiffness. Now, the most uh, importantly, what has to be understood is the stiffness is the ability of a component or the part of a component or a part of a system itself to resist elastic deformation or displacement. Here, we need to highlight that the system has to be elastic. So thereby, the, the this definition is applicable only within the elastic limit or displaces under the action of external force. So here, as elastic deformation are the only range that should not exceed the engineering allowances. So the very important thing about knowing about the stiffness is the, the displacement or whatever uh, de deformations is apply applied, it has to be within the elastic limit. Now, the stiffness is a parameter reflecting the relationship between the deformation of the structure and the magnitude of the force. So if in case you have learned about the stiffness, you always have laid the force and the deformations and thereby, you know, you get the uh, formulas for the stiffness. We look into that uh, in the next uh, few slides maybe. Um, so if in case uh, you apply, you have a spring system, I think you would have done with an actual system and uh, you know that when it is subjected to uniaxial tension, it undergoes elongation and thereby you would have uh, derived uh, 
the deflection formula. So if I reorganize and uh, you put it across the P by delta, you get the, uh, the stiffness of that particular uh, actually uh, tensile uh, the, or the, uh, the forces applied onto that spring system or the by, I mean, actual uh, member. So the stiffness is, uh, unit is generally given in Newton, uh, Newton meter, Newton per meter. So this is the things that you would know. And the stiffness, the types of stiffness, we have static stiffness and dynamic stiffness. That means the load that is applied onto the system that you were talking about, with, if in case you are not of the spring or the member, actual member, you would apply a constant load and it doesn't vary with time. Or if in case you need to look into it more, uh, more into depth, that means the there are no inertial forces that is generated within the body or it doesn't allow any uh, inner acceleration to be uh, there or any actual acceleration parameter won't be there that means the system is uh, subjected to the static loading condition thereby you get the static stiffness of that particular system or the member if in case uh, the structure is subjected to some uh, the loading that is varying with time as well as the inertial forces becomes important uh, or significant uh, which are really uh, going to change the behavior of the system itself then you call such a such a system to be dynamically loaded and as well as the system also can have uh, we need to consider the dynamic stiffness the static stiffness which you are going to study in this particular uh, syllabus which is limited uh, to the uh, this semester or your course would be mostly of the structural stiffness and the static stiffness um, can also include uh, both structural stiffness and contact stiffness and mostly we will be looking into the structural stiffness now the again you know when you look into the structural stiffness uh, there are various type of structural stiffness which uh, you can uh, you can uh, relate to your uh, in your subject that is the bending stiffness the torsional stiffness the actual stiffness there are various types of stiffness uh, that comes into play when you look at the uh, formulas for this uh, stiffness it is you can easily know which of the parameter are enhancing the stiffness and which of the parameter are reducing the stiffness the stiffness and the flexibility are two uh, in I mean or two different uh, things that are uh, in to each other so that means if I have to talk about stiffness I can say it's the inverse of flexibility how flexible is the system how stiff is the system is quite uh, different from each other so we are talking about the stiffness now if in case I have a material I have a um, I have a metal or a, a rod or a bar that has got the it is made up of a material and it, which has got the Ings modulus E and the area of that is A and it is subjected to uniaxial tension within the elastic limit or it is subject to uniaxial force within the elastic limit and that member is having a length L. So now if in case it has a length of one meter let's say and you find the axial stiffness you'll find that the as the length increases the axial stiffness is going, going on uh, reducing that means the L is reducing the axial stiffness whereas when I increase any of one of these parameters in the numerator it is going to definitely uh, increase the axial stiffness. Now when it comes to the bending so whenever you have a bending so you know that moment of inertia comes into play whenever there's a bending this both terms that is this uh, multiplied with this is called flexural rigidity this is called the axial rigidity now thereby because of the rigidity now you know that this is going to enhance the bending stiffness whereas the length again is going to reduce the uh, stiffness so you need to look into these things how the stiffness is going to be uh, affected uh, how the system is going to be affected because of these parameters as you all know again as we have said that the strength is important and as well as stiff stiffness is also important parameter when designing a structure. Now, as you know that the whenever you take up a material, both these terms has to be understood in a more uh, clear, clear way. So now, if you look at the uh, the uh, stress strain graph, uh, what you learn in your first uh, strength of materials, there you will understand lots of uh, lots of lots of things that how strength and stiffness are related to each other. How we need to understand the strength and stiffness by just looking at the uh, the test uni actual test that is conducted on a specimen. So I think uh, most of you would have learned it in your uh, earlier semesters. Uh, more on this particular uh, testing that is tensile testing on the steel and the stress strain graph that you do. So this is a specimen and as you know that the details of the specimen and the method of uh, testing is 
uh, kindly, uh, it is completely defined in IS 6, uh, 1608, that is 1608-1995. You can just look into that. The whole, uh, uh, the whole details is given about this, and I think you should be knowing much on this. If you see there are four zones, you can divide this into four zones, uh, wherein you can see there are only three zones here, but there's going to be one more zone that is called the yield. Okay, so now you have the four zones here, and then you can see what is happening here. You can see the initially uh, when this uh, when the when the system is not strained, you can see what is happening with the graph. It is at the zero point, and slowly when we strain within the elastic limit, it takes a linearity. Between this linearity, you always find the stiffness, or you always find the Young's modulus. So you can see that though the system is being strained, it is being subjected to load. We are talking about the strength, but thereby because of these forces, there is a deformation that is taking place, and this deformation is within the elastic limit. Thereby, we are able to find the stiffness of the system. Now, if in case this we are talking about the system, we need to confine ourselves to this elastic zone. Whereas to beyond that, we are only talking about the deformations that is happening, and because of the deformation, how the deformation is, uh, I mean, how the forces are affecting the deformations are also being uh, spoken much about. So the strength is going to be concentrated there. So you can easily see that this point is talking about the yield strength. So here you can see that this is talking about the stiffness. So whereas from here to here, we are talking about what is happening with the strength. You can see there is a fracture, uh, fracture strength, the ultimate tensile strength. So and what is happening beyond this point is that the deflection is taking or the straining is happening uh, enormously. So this all this is the what you have learned initially and you should know that strength and stiffness has to be properly understood in you know, order to understand this subject. Now, uh, the important properties of the in the designs are going to be the stress and strain uh, characteristics of any material. So, and as you all know, these are size dependent and uh, measures of load and displacement respectively. So, you need to know that how the stresses and strains are varying with the materials, the elastic behavior. So, you need to understand whenever a system is subjected to some type of loading, it undergoes uh, the strain, and when it undergoes strain, and when you release that, uh, the loading, and if in case the, the the system is strained within the elastic limit, thereby it gets reversed, and this is uh, this uh, is uh, this is called as uh, the elastic def uh, deformation or elastic behavior. If in case there is a permanent deformation because of the excessive loading beyond the elastic limit, and it doesn't get back to its uh, original shape or size then you call it as a plastic behavior. So this is what you know. Uh, these are the basic things that you should be knowing. The, and the resilience, that is the ability of the material to store energy, energy stored uh, that is best in the elastic uh, region. So this is the resilience and toughness, the energy needed to break a unit volume of material and ductility, the plastic strain of utter failure. So these are the terms that we look into. Now, if you see the elastic deformation and you go to, into the microscopic level, if you look at this bar being subjected to the uniaxial uh, you got the uh, uh, you got a um, okay you got the this is the uniaxial bar that is subjected to uniaxial forces if you force this up within the elastic limit you can see the orientation within this particular zone that is the micro level you can see that there is going to be completely expansion here and once this this deformation is minimal and you release uh, from loading that means it's completely gets back to its normal sh uh, uh, normal uh, shape and size and thereby uh, the that is completely elastic and it is completely reversible that means whatever was earlier it is it got back to its Original shape. That means one I when I subject this to, this to uni actual force and that is within the elastic limit. Whatever uh, reorganization that happened within the uh, because of the deformation or because of the straining and that when it is released, it went back to its normal. During this course. The force versus deflection can take up the linear uh, direction or it can also be non-linear elastic. So that means it can take a, a curvature rather than taking the linear, uh, uh, okay, linear, uh, that is P versus delta having a linear, li linear relations, but whereas it can also have the curvy linear or uh, the non-linear relation also. So, but it has to be reversed. So you have the linear elastic as well as non-linear elastic. We are only confining ourselves to the linear elastic theories. Now, if you look at the plastic deformation, you take the material, the material, now you have the, the same specimen that is being subjected to uniaxial tension. Now, the 
the, the deformation that is subjected or the load that is being applied onto this is quite large or it crosses its elastic limit or thresholds. Now you can see there is a maximum changes in its uh, internal properties or in, in distribution of the strains and as well as the distribution of its, uh, the what happens with this is the bond between the each of the is going to be, uh, that is going to be stretched and thereby it loses its potential to get back to its original, uh, original shape. But during this process, it will still have some tendency to get back, but it won't be exactly of the previous one. So there you can see that once uh, the load is applied beyond the elastic limit and you release it, there the, the, uh, the system is going back, but this time it is going to have some permanent deformation. But it may not be as much as what you give because it will have a little bit of resistance to get back to its original shape, but it would have lost certain things. So thereby it's, it is uh, still, in, uh, it's still in the deformed condition. Okay, so the, you can see here the how you can see from the graph is that if you look at the stress and strain uh, relations, you can easily see that where initially when you took the curve, when you are uh, deforming, uh, that is you are applying the load, it took this curve and later once you release it, it got back to uh, the other line, but be because there is a shift. Uh, there is a shift because of the deformation. Uh, if in case it would have retracted back on the same uh, curve, that means you can say it was having an elastic behavior. But here, because of the deformation that is uh, still there, because of which it takes a new uh, path and thereby it returned to uh, this particular point of equilibrium. So this is uh, something to do with the plastic deformation. These are the things that you know already, but still just to, uh, as I said, just to start uh, the subject, the res resilience, ability to observe energy without permanent deformation. So that's uh, that's the definition of resilience. So there should be no permanent deformation, but that means elastic only. The toughness is the total energy uh, absorption capability of a material that is elastic plus plastic. So this is this is the definition of the toughness. So you know the units of that and uh, the definition of it, the energy stored during deformation. And you should know that when you are talking about toughness, there could be some plastic deformation as well. So graphically, it is an area under the stress strain graph. You look into this, you can see that if you want to measure the resilience, you subject the uh, material to some type of uh, testing that is uh, tensile testing or the compression testing. And uh, you try to evaluate uh, the uh, the stress strain or the P delta. Now, what you get is you're trying to find its strength abilities and the stiffness abilities. Now, because of it, it has got the strength as well as the stiffness, thereby it has certain energy absorption capacity. And you can also see that there, if you measure the, the area underneath the stress strain graph be, be, uh, from the elastic point, that is the uh, yield point, and within that, you get the resilience. And if I measure the total area, you between the zero to the maximum, then you get the toughness. So that's the definition of this. So that's what is given here, the toughness energy to break a unit volume of material, or it is a measure of its ability of a material to absorb energy up to the factor or impact resistance. Now, uh, this is what is given. So uh, now the, when it comes to brittle failure, uh, the elastic energy, no apparent plastic deformation takes place uh, during this fracture or ductile fracture, elastic energy plus plastic energy are going to be there. So this you can easily relate for two types of material. Now you can see here, you have the uh, modulus of resilience, you have the modulus of toughness, you have the toughest, uh, you can easily make out which among these is the toughest material, which among these is the stronger material. So whenever you are given a, a material and you do the testing and you make a comparison of their stress strain curves, you should be able to say or you should be able to easily locate which of this is a stronger material and which of this is a tougher material. The toughness uh, needs to be checked into, the resilience is also be checked into. So you need to know which of this is going to be tougher and which of this is going to be a stronger material. So that you can do only by uh, taking a look at the curve, the way the material has behaved in the uh, P delta analysis or the P delta that is uh, when you are subject the member to the uh, uniaxial tension and then you know you find the properties of stress and strain and you draw the graph and as well as the area underneath. So you get um, the various characteristics of that particular member. Now, 
uh, as I said, you may have various types of um, materials that you test in the lab and your idea is to get uh, which of this is tougher because you need to use the energy absorption cap capability capability of that particular uh, specimen now you have the uh, you have the graphs for various three materials you can see here this is ceramic the first the blue one is for the ceramic the green one is for the metal and this is for the unreinforced polymers if i subject that three specimen for the uni axial tension and uh, also measure its uh, stress versus strain you get the graph of this kind and you can easily make out that you can see the deformation for this, the straining capacity of this is different, the straining capacity of this is different, this one is different, but the stress ca capabilities of that, the, uh, st uh, the actual stresses capacity of this is quite different, this is quite different, and you can also see the pattern of deformation is also very, very different. So by looking at this, you can easily make out which of this is having the small toughness, larger toughness, and very small toughness. So this is very important. Now you can easily make out now to how to find which is tough and which is also the stronger material. So basically understanding the stress strain graph is so, so important in order to understand or in order to find which of the material is going to be um, the best for your application. Now, similarly, you can take uh, the carbon itself, uh, carbon steel, which we extensively use in uh, various applications, including civil engineering as well as in mechanical engineering. You have the high carbon steel and the medium carbon steel and low carbon steel. Now, you have known that, you know, which is the strongest. The high carbon steel uh, is strongest and the medium carbon steel is toughest and low carbon is most ductile, which is used in earthquake engineering. OK, so that is in my field of application where maybe uh, you apply in where there is a, lo a lot of uh, uh, dynamic loading. So now if you look at this particular thing, your question would be uh, you can easily find which of this is strongest, which of this is toughest, which of is ductile. So knowing which of this is stronger is a different, you know, the way we understand things is material wise is very different. Which of this is tough is very different and which of this is ductile is very different. So knowing these basics is very important before you get into the field of mechanical engineering. So the ductility, the very important factor, once we have learned the, uh, the resilience and the toughness, the next thing is the ductility. Ductility may be described as the ability of the material to change its shape without fracture. Uh, in other words, the ductility of the structure or its member is the capacity to undergo large inelastic deformation without significant loss of strength or its stiffness. So both, you can see from a single graph, we are trying to relate that the strength and stiffness. That's why we started with the strength and stiffness. Now, knowing these and the stress strain graph, we are now defining various uh, the details or various requirement that needs to be known uh, for the one particular material that is ductile, ductility. The stress strain curve of a material also indicates the ductility. So we all know that we took our graph and from this graph, we started finding out which of the material is stronger, which of the material is tougher. Now we are trying to understand which of the material is going to be uh, having a better ductility. Now it is the it is defined as the amount of permanent strain, that is strain exceeding the proportionality limit up to the point of fracture. So that's the definition uh, that you should know. And if you let, take a look at this particular graph, you have a, a particular uh, uh, material that doesn't have a, a proper yield point, wherein you take the uh, you know you take these group uh, that is a, a strain. You take the strain of 0.002, and you take a uh, you take a uh, parallel line to it, and you get the yield point. When the yield is not properly defined, you do this uh, uh, process, and you try try to determine the particular uh, uh, yield point. And once you know the yield point, from there you try to find. Uh, you also draw the you know the the final uh, point where it breaks and thereby you connect it and you connect a parallel line to it and you find the area between and you try to find the ductility. So the ductility of any tension uh, test specimen can be measured even by percentage elongation uh, when it is compared with the that of the original. So the ductility of the material is sometimes indicated by the ratio of the total energy absorbed by the material to the elastic energy. This is also one of the ways of uh, getting the ductility measurement. So so you, if you take any metal, and we already know that we try to find a subject that to the uh, the forces, and then it deformed, and thereby we try to find the stresses and the strains, and we got the 
percentage that is you found the variation what is happening with the stress versus strain you found that and you also found the area of uh, that specimen that being changed because of the uh, test procedure itself and it has crossed certain point that is the elastic point and thereby gets into the plastic zone and you also measured the change in length from the final to the original and then you got it and this is defined by the uh, percentage elongation. So there is also a area reduction wherein you this also uh, helps us to find the ductility or in that way of measuring the ductility. Now with that we understood that the uh, we, ha we have uh, three major important things that is uh, strength, stiffness and stability are very very important uh, but uh, knowing these three things we can easily make out uh, that how best uh, your uh, engineering uh, designs are. For that, whenever you take a material and uh, put it uh, across in a system so that you uh, start defining your system or developing your system using a material, you should know which of this uh, is going to help you and you should know for which you should give importance. Whether uh, you should give importance to strength, whether you should give importance to stiffness, or whether you should give uh, importance to the ductility or its energy absorption capacity, it's almost uh, always important. Sometimes you may be designing a memory uh, where you may be designing um, uh, a, 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 a vehicle that needs to be dissipating energy. So you need to give more importance to the energy absorption of it. So as well, you know, you need to have a little bit of ductility into it. You should add ductility into it. Or if in case you make it more ductile, it could be more, uh, uh, they, that could fail also. So you need to make a balance between these things and the strength and stiffness. Sometimes you may need the complete strength in certain points and you may need the stiffness in certain points. So you have learned these basic things in the strength of materials on the aloe, on the uh, halo shaft and the solid shaft which of this is more strong or which of this is more stiff these are the basic things that you will learn all these all these things what you do is just giving the fundamentals of uh, understanding the safe design safe engineering design so the very requirement of a safe engineering design is to properly understand the material behavior and thereby also um, satisfy the system with the strength, stiffness, and the stability. So when you look at this particular graph, uh, the slide which I've shown, you can see the strength is measured on the uh, vertical axis, the ductility is spread along the uh, horizontal axis, then the if you see the energy absorption is uh, spread across the both the axis that is this is going to spread across these axis the angle that is being uh, uh, substandard between the horizontal and the uh, line the the the, the line that is the elastic line of any material defines the stiffness. So if you know this particular thing and you take up any material testing and you, you want to compare, you can easily make out which of the material has got high strength, high ductility, energy absorption or stiffness. You can also sometimes you may have to do a compromise. But there will be always a trade-off. You won't get everything pleased, but definitely, you know, you, you can make it a point. You choose the right, uh, right option among various materials that is available in the industry. So this is about... Uh, uh, the the strength and the stiffness and the relations and you would have learned all this uh, while uh, in your uh, strength of materials and as well as uh, in your other courses they would have emphasized in a different way and uh, they would have given you the details even in the material science they would have gone into the macro level and the micro levels and they would have uh, you would have understood the same behavior the elastic behavior the plastic behavior and elastoplastic behavior all these details but basically the idea is to understand the material behavior from the uh, for getting a most uh, safe engineering design. So the most important thing uh, when it comes to the engineering aspect is stability. Now, uh, as I, uh, I mean, you can read out this slide, it's not necessary to be a structural engineer to have the sense of what it means for a structure to be stable. In place of structures, when it comes to mechanical engineering, you can call it as a system, or uh, in place of, uh, you, you may be suitably placed, uh, because we call uh, a system that is composed of various assemblages of members and its components uh, subject to the loading in the equilibrium, subject to a lot of boundary conditions and uh, the all the uh, equations of equilibrium and the compatibility everything is being applied and uh, such a system is called as 
uh, the structure, it may be in the mechanical engineering, the same definition is applicable. But, but we can call a structure or a system. So if in case I have included structure, that means it's a system. So it is not necessary to be a structural engineer to have a sense of what it means for a system to be unstable. So it is not necessary for you to know, but most of us know what is instability. Now, uh, you know that most of us, uh, you know, whenever you are with your parents or with your, you know, when you're really stressed out, you do, people don't refer you with respect to your stability, but they refer to you uh, with respect to your instability during uh, during uh, the wrong time. So whenever you are uh, not in a good mood, that means you are very much aware of the instability of yourself. So most of us have an inherent understanding of the uh, definition of instability, that a small change in load will cause a large change in the displacement. So if you just apply the psychology here, you'll understand what is uh, instability. So that means even a small uh, a word of uh, you know discouragement can put you into a big uh, disaster. That's what it means. So similarly, when it comes to the system, now you had a small load, and uh, even though the load is very, very marginal, but this could cause, uh, after a certain point, this could cause a large change in the displacement that could be catastrophic. And that talks about the uh, instability. Uh, that's what is about instability. This instability, whatever we are learning today, though it is more uh, focused on uh, the columns, but uh, you have to understand in a, uh, in a more, uh, more uh, better way that means you are talking about any system going uh, undergoing the change uh, drastic change with small variation in certain parameters and thereby it loses its stability so not necessarily that you know you are to just uh, apply this to only columns wherein you load the column at certain point it gives away and then it displaces maximum and gives away and it buckles that's not a, that's not the whole uh, idea of uh, teaching stability but kind noting this type of uh, understanding you can apply the same concept to various other uh, situations and uh, you will also be able to define all the uh, stability definitions. Now, if this change in displacement is large enough or it is in the critical member of a structure, a local or the member instability may cause collapse of the entire structure. So, this particular uh, stability is very, very important aspect. Now, if in case you are, uh, you are all civil, I mean, if in case you are all mechanical engineers, you would have gone for a trip you stand next to a pyramid uh, the pyramid if you stand next to a pyramid you'll face you'll feel that it is more stable but if you go stand next to a rock which has just been simply supported or it has been standing at the edge a large uh, uh, a sp a spherical uh, boulder or the a large spherical uh, rock that's been just been supported on the edge and it's not fallen but it is in equilibrium but you will never feel uh, safe enough to st uh, stand below it the stability also gives you the positive feel so so the stability is a very, very important aspect even in psychology. The stability is also important when it comes to the performance. Uh, when it comes to consistency, people, when it comes to literal language, the consistency is mistook as a stability. But stability can, uh, when a person is co constantly performing, is called as stable. So most of the structures which are co uh, consistently performing also can be called as stable when it even though it was uh, it is subject to type of loading or any marginal changes in it and it get back to its normal position it is called as stable structure so we basically most of us as engineers know the definition uh, of instability uh, because we all undergo this at any situations of time so thereby understanding stability is going to be quite simple the reverse of that is nothing but this stable structure so now now if you take uh, this particular uh, uh, you see this particular slide if an object is displaced slightly from the equilibrium and uh, released okay so let's say you take uh, this particular uh, uh, equilibrium uh, stable condition I'm talking about this okay now let's say you go to um, move this particular ball over here and then you're going to release it it's going to go up and down and come back to its neutral whereas when you just disturb this if you just disturb a little it will just get away from this particular uh, position now you know this this has again even you need to be in constant touch with this and this is not this is going to be this is uh, this is a state where it is not it is going to get displaced now the definition of each of this is uh, said as if an object is displaced slightly from the equilibrium and uh, released 
and the object moves to a new position, then the object uh, is, uh, is in the state of unstable equilibrium. So we are talking about the unstable equilibrium where the this system is disturbed and it doesn't come back to its original position. Okay, so you can also consider this as if in case you just have to, this is a ball that I disturbed it, so it won't come back to it normal. But if you take up this mechanical um, uh, system, now uh, you can see that this particular system is an, uh, it's a hinge and it has been hang, hung. So it's like, you know, you just pull, uh, pull it. Uh, okay, I think there is a reverse of it. I'm sorry, uh, there is a change. Uh, I think this is not corrected. This is, this is the system I'm talking about. And this is the condition There is a mistake of mine. So you just have to take the system and uh, this is referring to this. I'm sorry for this. So now if I make a slightest change for this, this is going to get away and it's not going to come back to its equilibrium condition. Okay, so that's the diagram. So you need to refer to, I'm sorry, maybe I just uh, put it in the wrong place. Now, if you look at the, uh, the next one, that is if in case, let's say, if you consider the same uh, equilibrium stable, you can also take it as when uh, energy is input into a system, okay? And that means the system is slightly disturbed and uh, that means it will undergo a major change so that this object will move and uh, will get uh, uh, get affected so this is also uh, this is also uh, called as unstable equilibrium so it's like you know you put in extra energy into your body and if your body is not able to resist you will not get back to its normal that is the state that i'm talking about equilibrium unstable so now this is the example for it that means you have a hinge you have a column that has been supported on a hinge if in case at the one particular point you just push it it is going to fall or at well, i mean uh, before it has been well balanced, it is going to stand still. So that is the point we are talking about. That is the equilibrium uh, at unsta uh, unstable equilibrium condition. So even if a slightest change in it, the whole system is going to get affected. Now, if you look at the uh, the second one, that is the stable equilibrium. Now, this is the first di uh, this is the first uh, system uh, that I'm referring to, and the diagram is here. Uh, okay, so sorry for that again. The equilibrium uh, stable or stable equilibrium you see that the system if it is disturbed it gets back to its normal or the original position that's called the stable equilibrium so you can think as this as a okay this one like you know you just this is a hung uh, system wherein you have the hinge and you have the member that is hung if i just move it a little and it starts uh, oscillating and it gets back to its uh, original position after a few seconds or a few minutes. So thereby you call such a system which is going to come back its original as in the state of stable equilibrium. So that means if in case you consider any system, not just necessarily these column system or any system when you induce some type of uh, energy into the system and that energy it's not going to disturb much but whereas after a few minutes it gets back to its normalcy, such a system is called uh, uh, that is, that's a system is called as the uh, system under stable equilibrium. Now you have uh, the one more condition that is going to be that if the object is displaced slightly from the uh, equilibrium condition and release the objective remains where it is. That means you just have to just uh, move this particular uh, ball you just move it whenever you move it it's going to reach a new position but it is going to be uh, uh, remaining uh, in the same position for the next uh, force that to be in you so if you take this that the, if the hinge is in the between and you can see the rotating axis when you disturb it it uh, gets disturbed and later it gets, comes back to its equilibrium so this is the this is called the uh, neutral equilibrium condition so you can also think it as the when the energy is added to the object the object will, will move uh, uh, to some point and then it will stop and this go, i mean this is going to allow for some changes so this is called the neutral equilibrium state so you have the stability of equilibrium it could be defined as equilibrium unstable equilibrium stable and equilibrium neutral and it could be also defined as stable equilibrium uh, unstable equilibrium stable equilibrium and neutral equilibrium so it can be uh, the you can understand this particular uh, thing by this particular uh, diagrams and these are the systems uh, this is stable unstable and then this is neutral equilibrium system so this principle can be applied not just only to the uh, syllabus that you are uh, uh, you have been uh, asked to that is columns but it can be uh, subject to any it can be applied on to any uh, systems okay now the instability is a phenomena which uh, 
disables an element member or a structure to carry further load due to excessive uh, de deflection lateral to the direction of loading and vanishing stiffness so structural instability is defined as a condition in which uh, is no tendency for the structure to return to its initial position so these are the definitions that is given in your standard textbooks so the, we are as i said we need to understand we, are, we basically could relate to the instability thereby the definition of instability is first learned and thereby you get a sense of what is stability. Now, since we are uh, dealing with the, uh, the column, the column buckling, the Euler column buckling theory, so now the, uh, the buckling, uh, we need to relate that uh, theory or the column, of, uh, what is happening with the column to this particular uh, stabilities. Right. So let's understand how uh, how we can relate it. The buckling load corresponding to the state of neutral equilibrium, but not necessarily to stability limits. Okay. So this is the this is the state. The buckling load is often associated with the characteristic change of the structure before and uh, therefore may be considered as a limit state of serviceability. So it falls under the categories of uh, the neutral equilibrium and sometimes you know, it could be in the equilibrium. The critical load in some cases of a column buckling serves as the bifurcation point of equilibrium path the load such bifurcation is called the buckling load i will talk about this maybe uh, next in few cases the buckling load is a stable limit as well as the uh, neutral equilibrium so uh, if in case you want to relate uh, the equilibrium states that is the uh, stable equilibrium unstable equilibrium or neutral equilibrium state the column can be in any of these states and we look into it uh, one by one or, or maybe with some cases now, when you take a uh, column, or uh, because we are dealing with a subject called uh, uh, Euler's column uh, buckling theory, so we need to we'll be confining ourselves to the discussion on this that is there in your syllabus, and uh, these columns are nothing but the compression members. So, are these purely a compression member? Definitely not in reality, but the columns uh, are always subject to uniaxial forces. So these forces has to lie in the central axis or the neutral axis, but definitely not in reality it happens, but that's the assumption that we take into consideration. So a column is the uh, structural member that undergoes compressive stress. Whether the stress is uh, evenly distributed, non-evenly distributed, that's, the, uh, that's the going to be a big debate, but we will understand the definition of column as the structural member that undergoes only a compression stresses. Now, when it comes to the column design, when you design a column, be it in a mechanical engineering or in civil engineering, we take two things into consideration. That is the column strength. Now, you all know the column, the strength factor, because you, we learned something about the strength and stiffness. So you should know that column and uh, also the stability. The, the column design in civil engineering or in mechanical, there is also stiffness also involved here and when it is subjected to lateral forces. Here we are assuming the only the compressive stresses only, therefore we have not included the stiffness here, okay, the bending stiffness here. So thereby the, the more, what is predominant uh, in, the, in such a design is the column strength and the column stability, okay. So its ability to support load without experiencing excessive stress. So that means when a column is subjected to some load, there is going to be some load that is acting on an area and that area is being subjected to internal forces. The internal forces resisted by the material per unit area gives you the stress. So now you know that because of the external loading, there is an internal stress that is developed and uh, that uh, that has to be in tune. That means the material resistance should be uh, such that, that you can resist the, uh, the load that is coming onto it or that is spread onto it, the compressive stresses. So the that's the very important thing. So the column uh, strength is very important and as well as the column stability. Uh, stability. Now, as you all know, it's, a, uh, it's ability to support the load without experiencing sudden change in its configuration. It's called as foam or, or the form. So whenever you have a shape, there is a change of the shape. So that's the configuration. Sometimes the columns will be made up of multiple uh, points or multiple hinges and uh, it will be well balanced. So that's why it is, called, it is put here as configuration. So in case you have the columns with various type of configuration, because of which there could be a lot of changes in the column. And whenever there is a change, 
which are the these uh, the because of these there is a change in its configuration we call that uh, that column to be uh, uh, to be have uh, uh, displaced or it is sub, it is unstable so the column stability is very important it is an ability to support load without experiencing sudden change in its configuration now whenever you have these two definitions for design that means you should know how the designs are developed the designs are developed based on the studies that is conducted on its failure or experiments that is conducted and understanding the failure of a system now we would have conducted the material testing in the labs and you would understood that uh, the column is made up of a material and that material is good enough to take up the compressive stresses then that means it if it is within the elastic limit then there won't be any material failure but it crosses a threshold depending on the material whether it is a brittle material or a ductile material the material is going to fail so the column is going to have a failure that is going to be ma uh, material failures and the material failures can have various types of failures again it can be subcategorized as you know various type of failures buckling failure or twisting or various type of failures that, that will happen so because uh, it could have the material failure can be the crushing the you know the fractures and the, uh, the various type of uh, failures like that so then the column because the column loses its uh, because of the dimensions of the column it loses uh, its uh, configuration or it loses its form and thereby it buckles the buckling is very different from bending the language that is used in technical uh, uh, colleges or in the engineering is very very specific it is not referred to as bending but it is buckling two different things two different meaning but a column is said to be buckled under the axial forces so within the elastic limit that's what we are dealing with in the Euler's uh, column buckling so therefore you should be noting that the buckling is not uh, equal to bending what we study in engineering but definitely yes the system is undergo will go a configuration change that looks almost similar to the bending so it is obviously it goes undergoes bending but the buckling phenomenon is very very different that is that needs to be learned now when you see the column now the column has its own dimensions the materials and it is made as i said the stresses is nothing but the force per unit area or p by a is nothing but the stress so you know that this is the area and as you know that this length parameter is going to change the way the column is going to behave that's what we spoke and we are going to see how the material um, failure will take place and before that we'll see what are the different definitions of columns the columns can be called uh, categorized as long column short column and medium column okay the shortest column is sometimes called as pedestal now uh, the short column is always subjected to direct compression stress only that's the uh, that's assumption but that's also valid assumption because the other things are most insignificant failure occurs purely due to crushing only that's the most important failure that happens in the short column that's why the short column has to be the strength has to dictate uh, the particular design when it comes to short column the that's why the if you see the earthquake resistance structure or you look into the structure that has been more uh, subjected to some type of impact load you won't be expecting to have a short column because because of which there is no dissipation or there's no ductility feature and that that could be a uh, uh, that could be uh, crashing and uh, that, that's a failure that uh, sometimes you may not expect in certain situations so failure occurs purely uh, due to crushing slenderness ratio is less than 80 i will just skip this because we are not looked into this it's uh, it's uh, length to least dimension is less than of the eight these are the few definitions that is given in your standard textbooks which i've replicated here now the long column uh, basically when it is subjected to the uniaxial force it is it starts buckling that's the buckling is going to be uh, the buckling force is going to induce a buckling stress so you will have the the column is subjected to buckling stress only why is that highlighted because as i said there is whenever you sub, uh, subject a member uh, to some type of forces you can have various types of forces that will come onto a, uh, this particular structure that is actual force it could be uh, a shear force it could be torsional it could be bending it could be buckling or anything but here we are only concentrating on the buckling so therefore it is subject to buckling only but we are not talking about any bending stresses or anything so thereby the long columns are dictated by buckling so this is uh, the this is, uh, this is the kind of, this is the property of a long column the short column is going to fail by strength so the short, whenever you take a small column 
and you subject that to an enormous load, you can see the failure is going to be by uh, breaking it down or, you know, it can be, you know, getting into a very bad shape. That could be, uh, but uh, the shape uh, here, what we are talking, I mean, if in case you are talking about a short column and you are subject it to the, the uh, compression. So if in case it is too soft thing, and you can say that to be buckling also, that could be, but it is always the strength failure that we are interested in when it comes to short columns. When it comes to the long column, you take the longer stick and you just subject that to some type of uh, minimal loading, you will see that it's going to buckle and the stresses are induced. And you should know that the uh, the longer the column, the shorter, I mean, the larger is the uh, buckling stresses. So thereby, you should know that the capacity of uh, load carrying capacity of a long column is going to get reduced with its length. So thereby, the the if you take a column of the same uh, area and the same material and everything, you just increase the length of uh, the column. The larger it goes, the lesser the weight it can take. So that's the uh, that's the problem, and thereby it also fails by buckling only. The slenderness ratio is uh, is given to be more than 120. It's at least uh, lateral dimension is uh, more than 30. This is the definition that is given in your textbook. Now, as you all know, I was talking about the material failure. You can see this is the animated. Uh, I just try to run this. So you can see that whenever you subject uh, the material to some load, if it is a short column and uh, there the area comes into play and you can see that the material is going to fail. That's the most important thing. So here when I apply the excessive loading, the area comes into play. The compression force is defined by the applied force and the applied force by the cross section area and you know the units of it. So thereby the column, the short column is going to fail by the material. So this is important and here what we see is the compression stress is defined by P by area of cross section. Now this is what we see the failure of short column resulting from the compression axial force looks like this. You can see from the ductile material for the brittle material. Though you can see there is uh, some thought of uh, change in the deformation but what is dictated is the, the, the compressive forces and the material properties. That's why it is called as uh, the material failure. So it is going to be ductile material failure and brittle material failure. You can see that whenever the applied forces uh, are uh, then you have the stresses within the some uh, limits. We'll talk about the limits later. Whenever you have a limit that is the ultimate limit of this particular member, that is this is when it is going to yield or beyond the yield, then it then you will have uh, if it is the forces are the stresses are within the. Uh, the stresses of ultimate, that means it's called safe. When it crosses that uh, limit, then it is called a failed, failed design. So you can see the ductile material is going to uh, break into or shear into two or multiple pieces, whereas the ductile is going to get compressed and uh, thereby the failure takes place. Um, these failures are basically the material failure and this is exclusively for the failures of a short column. Whereas when it comes to the long column, what we see is if you have a question how it would uh, fail so that you can see that it is going to fail by buckling. So if I, the same load I try to apply onto this uh, particular uh, uh, long member, if I subject that long member to the loading, you can see that the member has buckled because of the actual force. And that's very important. That means the system is subjected to the actual force, but the force, the, because of the, the very nature of the geometries of this particular um, element, as you can know, because the previous example we saw the geometry was minimal, so that means it has a short column, whereas this is going to be enormously long column. Now you can easily take a guess because of the length there is going to be uh, the change in its profile or the configuration, but although it is being subjected to agile forces only. So this type of failure is known as the buckling failure. Now, when it comes to the mechanical engineering, you can take, a, a, I, call, I think it's, this is called the winch or this is a, called a, I mean, a holder, I don't know, it's called a player. So what you do is you hold a nail in between and you try to take a, you try to apply a force. Now you have to sense the force. It's very important to sense the process. Now, if you keep a force applied onto these two ends that you do with your hand, you slowly apply. There is one point wherein 
this nail will snap that means it will change immediately but post once it is snapped it it undergoes deformation at a faster rate and there's going to be a sudden failure until this point until this point that it can take the compression load you are safe enough but once it snaps you can see there is a spring like thing that is developed here and it is going to just go away give away and that's going to bend and that's a sudden failure so this type of failure is a buckling failure basically you can see such type of failure in any compression member and that is the instability that we are talking about this is the instability we are talking about not the instability of the rolling ball or it's going to be a, uh, if you stand next to a pyramid which i gave an example which is a very stable structure or next to the ball which is rolling it is unstable that also gives you the analogy of it but we are talking about the member and its performance we are talking about the stability uh, we are talking about the equilibriums uh, that uh, that we are emphasizing on so when it comes to the compression member and you subject that to a new axial force and you you know that when you do an analysis of this particular uh, um, the equipment or the device you can see that is exactly passing the uh, the forces that is it is passing the uh, the load uh, uni actually from this point to this point now it is being constantly subjected to the increasing load at one point it will give away once it gives away you feel that there is a spring that is formed here and it's going to bend suddenly and it is going to fail and this failure is very catastrophic same failures can be seen in various type of uh, engineering uh, systems and that is very very dangerous so buckling is a very important phenomena so as you all know you been into mechanical engineering progressively over a period of time you will be getting to various subjects wherein you will see such type of uh, buckling uh, process such type of buckling happening everywhere see the buckling as i said is a instability of equilibrium in a structure so you should always understand whenever you see the uh, the instability of equilibrium in any structure be it any form you call that system to be buckled that occurs for a compression load or stress in this cat in this uh, case a structure or its component may fail due to buckling at at load that are far smaller than those produced by material strength failures so we look into it now what it means is that whenever you have a structure you have a system let's say you have a system and you would have a, some, this as the capacity to take much of the stresses but because of its nature to buckle it will not take that much of load that if in case this was designed for 100 kg and then because of the failure of buckling it may not even take 10 kg also so buckling is a catastrophic failure i told you this example you can take the previous uh, uh, example you can try it out at your homes at uh, residence when you are in your kitchens you have this uh, holders uh, to hold your vessels you can try this and you can try to you know try to bend things you will get to know if in case you really want to know the pinch of this or uh, understand the subject put your finger in between definitely you will understand how bad it is how the failure takes place so i would request you to be safe before you do this but definitely understand the subject of uh, buckling and how serious it is because once the failure starts it's not going to end so that's the importance of buckling it's basically a instability of equilibrium of structures now how when a compression member becomes longer the role of geometry and stiffness uh, becomes more and more important so basically when we are dealing with buckling it gives you a sense that when the compression member becomes longer the role of geometry that means the the area and the stiffness of the member becomes more predominantly important so that's the sense you will get whenever you are working with long uh, columns or long compressive members for a long slender column buckling occurs uh, occurs uh, way before the normal stresses reaches the strength of the column material now let's take an example to understand this let's apply the load and let's assume this to be the long column now let's say that the capacity of this column is well known that means if the stresses of this let's say this is steel and when i subject this this could be the load divided by the area could have the bend the resistance to strength but because of the very nature of the geometry and the stiffness look at this the load is applied and that load is less than that of the stiff, uh, the strength uh, strength capacity but because of the uh, the profile that is a geometry and the stiffness this uh, member has given up so that means it is not any more straight which is required for your design but it is turned the configuration is changed which will affect the performance of the structure and such thing is nothing but this long slender column under has undergone the 
buckling and the buckling has reduced the load carrying capacity that means whatever we estimated here we are overestimated and failed by our design so very important is that we need to take that buckling into account in order to design any structure and this buckling is something to relate with instability so now as we all learned the crushing and the buckling so failures in any compression member now we were emphasizing on the buckling of a compression member and whenever you subject any uh, member to certain load and we learned that the geometry comes into play we learned that whenever at certain point it is going to give up and there is some load at which it starts giving up and there is a snap point or you take a as we saw in the previous uh, example so you know that there is one particular point uh, beyond which the member is going to start buckling or it is going to get into the uh, even completely getting into the buckling mode so you say that particular point or that particular load as buckling load and you also call it as as oil, uh, oilers critical buckling load now this particular name uh, was given or uh, it's uh, because of the uh, this because of the mathematician that is renold uh, renold uh, um hoyler you know that this particular formula for uh, euler's critical buckling was first formulated by uh, euler so you basically people pronounce them as euler or uh, various names but uh, definitely the uh, various people uh, pronounce them as euler so this is the uh, name that uh, is generally practiced even i have most of the time when i'm spelling it out names i make a lot of mistakes so this is the easiest way to understand this is basically euler uh, the renold euler is the person uh, Uh, uh one who was the first person to exactly predict the critical buckling so thereby this for the the, the definition of it and the assumptions and as well as the the formulation and then the derivation as well as the final law uh, the uh, formula to to reach to the i mean to determine the euler's critical buckling was uh, derived in uh, 1757 by euler uh, that is a is a swiss uh, mathematician who found that particular formula and basically he learned that uh, that many of the structures which are long and slender that means uh, you have any structure that could be any uh, compression member like vacuum tanks and whatever you you know from your mechanical engineering that when it is too slender or it is too long this undergoes uh, uh, this when it is subjected to compression force and there could be uh, the Uh, the sound system can which was stable earlier can get into the uh, state of uh, being unstable okay and that the the onset of uh, instability is called the buckling and uh, it is the phenomena where a structure will have a very large change in the displacement you can see here the system will have a very change in the uh, large uh, change in the displacement and there, there is no minimal change in the load also even if there is no change in the load or there could be a minor change in the load because of the uh, practicalities but the deflection or the displacement is going to be uh, larger by time so this is the onset of the instability or the buckling so that's what he, he tried to uh, Uh, figure it out by mathematical uh, finding mathematical solution for it so he was a person so he he was a person who formulated for the column buckling now for which he uh, assumed that to be uh, firstly he assumed this uh, his theory was completely applied on to uh, the structure that is uh, within the elastic limit that's very important to know and the idealized uh, fixed end column will exhibit the following behavior under the increasing axial load basically when he did uh, the formulation he assumed the uh, idealized column so i will talk about it uh, and he tried to load it up and then he found that there is a particular point that is called the bifurcation point beyond which the column is going to reach the unstable equilibrium the state of that that means when a system is subjected to some type of loading and because of the loading and if the system is a longer slender system wherein the geometries and the stiffness are predominant and there in that system the critical loading that is fcr or pcr that is a load at uh, the critical loading at that point is called as the bifurcation point a bifurcation point is a point in the load history where two branches of solutions are possible in this particular case you can see that the idealized fixed end columns at the critical load the column can buckle to the left or to the right that's very important thus the two load path are possible so not necessary that it has to define only in this way it can go on the other way also in case of real structure the the 
what happens in the real structure is that there could be some type of error, there could be some type of imperfection that is going to define the side that is going to buckle. So that is what we are going to uh, that is what we are going to see in reality. So where, whereas when you see that the uh, if you consider this to be force F and you consider this to be U, that is a displacement, you can see when the column is exactly subjected to the uniaxial uh, compression, you know that within this uh, the uh, the point that is be, with, uh, below this bifurcation point wherein uh, um, above this the system is going to buckle and below this it's not going to buckle you can see where exactly the stable equilibrium can be defined between this point to this point it's called as stable equilibrium at that point it's called as neutral equilibrium beyond which it is called as unstable equilibrium so that system uh, wherever this system is going to change that is uh, from uh, the uh, beyond the point or uh, that particular point is called the bifurcation point or the uh, critical point now to in order to derive the column buckling uh, equations by uh, euler I had to uh, consider some of the assumptions in order to please this mathematical uh, or in order to uh, get a feasible solution. So you should un understand that every of the engineer goes with an assumption. Now, what is an assumption? Assumption is a simplification of a physics such that uh, the feasible solution can be obtained mathematically to obtain the, the solutions that are most accurate. So that's the basic principles of an assumption. Now, the assumption, the column is is assumed to be initially straight and is uniformly uh, and as uniform lateral dimension. That's the first assumption. The compression load is uh, axial and passes through the centroid of the column section. That's the assumption that he did to derive the, but as you all know, in reality, this will not be true. The material of the column is perfectly homogeneous and isotropic, though this is achievable these days, but still, you know, it's questionable when it comes to the material property, but the assumption is good enough to get the, to the, to get the most approximate solutions. So not to worry much on that. So pin jointed are, and are frictionless and the fixed ends are perfectly rigid. When he derived it, he considered the pin jointed and the fixed conditions and various end conditions that he considered in order to derive the equation. So he assumed that pin joint are frictionless because the friction induces one more uh, equation and thereby that need not be so and then the perfectly rigid the self weight of the column is neglected so that's also one of the assumptions which is not true uh, but uh, definitely uh, it's going to be uh, negligible so thereby this assumption is valid the column fails by buckling alone so he, the though the column may have various type of imperfection which is not taken into account his assumption is that this particular column which is slender which is long as well as which has got the geometrical property and the material properties is going to fail only by buckling alone and he says that the limit of proportionality is not exceeded that means this whole system has to be within the elastic limit that's the Euler's theory and he put these assumptions in order to get the final equations that he derived for the critical buckling so there could be if in case uh, you're all students expecting some question and answers uh, on this particular um, uh, Euler buckling theory, there could be one question for five marks, what are the assumptions that was made by Euler, uh, uh, Euler for, the, uh, for the equation that he derived for the critical buckling, you may have to read out these things. Now the final result that the Swiss mathematician uh, Euler uh, determined the relations between the critical load that is PCR, that is it can be FCR or PCR, that is your convenience, you just have to read the, uh, uh, the concept rather than reading the uh, things here, that's not, uh, not to worry much. So the critical uh, load, the material, the section and the effective length. Okay, so he says that as long as this uh, whole system uh, that is made up of material is within the elastic limit, this particular equation is applicable. So all the assumptions, if it is uh, valid and then the material is within the elastic limit, then this particular equation is valid, wherein he says that the critical load, that is Euler's critical buckling load or the buckling critical buckling load is a function of the E and I, which is a rigidity, that is the rigidity that is talking about flexural rigidity, although this is a buckling, which is not, uh, I mean, we are not uh, confusing between the bending, but this is buckling, but still the flexural rigidity comes into play, the E and I. We will understand which of the I is going to come into play because it is going to bend the buckle in the direction which is going to be, have the least uh, resistance. So that is 
that's the emphasis we need to put here so though there is a, this is a combination is a flexural rigidity but this one is going to be the least axis the least moment of inertia and the length because we are all dealing with the longer column so you can see that the sensitivity of this particular equation if you take the sensitivity of this equation you can see that the uh, buckling load is going to be uh, enhanced that means the load carrying capacity is going to be reducing because of the length the higher the length you know it is going to get squared and thereby it is going to reduce drastically that means if you take a column of uh, one meter and a two meter you can easily make out how the column is going to be uh, affecting the critical buckling load so if you look at the sensitivity of this this is l square time so this is more more sensitive if i take a differential of this you can see that it is good this is the most uh, this is going to stay still and that means this is very very sensitive that we need to be very careful when you're dealing with the euler's critical buckling so thereby you can easily make out the length plays a very important role when it comes to oil buckling so well, let's define what is the buckling load or it is also called as critical load or the clip clip uh, clipping load so you have most of the time clip the buckling loads are uh, the crippling loads the load the critical load of a slender bar so you now you understand why about that word slender it has to be geometrical feature has to be there so the slender bar subjected to actual compression you know why it is actual because assumption is very clear and categorically says that it has to be actual exactly the centroidal axis okay and thereby the actual compression is that value of actual force that is just sufficient to keep that particular member in the slightly deflected configuration uh, that is the, what is the uh, critical buckling load or that particular point that is the maximum limiting point okay that is the bifurcation point the maximum limiting load at which the column tends to have lateral displacement or tends to buckle it's not bend okay whenever we say the whenever somebody ask you what is buckling please don't say the member is bent that's very wrong that the that means the column tends to have lateral displacement or tends to buckle is called the buckling or the crippling buckling takes place about the axis having minimum radius of gyration so uh, you should know what is the importance of radius of gyration it is root of i by a or the least moment of inertia you should know what is a moment of inertia now if you look at the sensitivity as i said the sensitivity of this the euler's critical buckling which is a, which is going to be uh, the p uh, previously when you take the short column it was p divided by a that means it was only talking about the load that is applied and the area that is applied now when it comes to euler's critical buckling you see that it's a function of e that means you know the modulus of elasticity is a function of material type the steel and the wood now if uh, there are few people who are still active in this uh, particular lecture i have a question if in case i can ask the question uh, the organizing uh, uh, team can uh, let me know whether i can ask question or uh, should i continue the presentation can yes sir you can ask the question okay the question is very simple i think it's a very simple question it is only for students and whether there is a right answer or a wrong answer both is required uh, but the question is among the materials given below or among the materials which i am going to list out which of the material is going to be elastic or which of the material is more elastic rubber steel wood which of this is more elastic any answers steel okay any any anyone else who can uh, contradict that okay so can uh, can uh, can you justify why it is steel okay can someone justify why it is steel if uh, you one of your friend happen to say that the steel is more elastic is there a justification for it it becomes beyond the elastic limits sorry strain produced in the steel is less which of this is elastic that's my question steel steel okay what is the justification for it because uh, steel is having less strain compared to rubber 
Okay, okay, okay. So, okay. It deforms right. to it's faster than any other material. Sorry? Sir, after it, it absorbs the energy and it uh, reforms into version steps uh, very faster. Sir. Okay, okay. Okay, now if you see uh, the Hooke's law, that is the, uh, gen I mean, it's not the generalized Hooke's law, I'm talking about the gen small, the Young's modulus is going to dictate uh, something about the elasticity actually. If you look at the definitions of elasticity, the Young's modulus is what uh, is going to uh, define the, uh, the elastic property of any material. So if you compare any materials and its Young's modulus, you can easily find out which of this is going to be uh, more elastic rather than uh, looking into various other aspects because the Young's modulus was the person Young's modulus as someone said he was talking about the strain yes that is definitely true but it has to be in elastic uh, limit itself so the Young's modulus is going to dictate whether the member is uh, more elastic or not now similarly when you look at the Euler's uh, critical buckling you see that it is also a function of I now this is the thing that you would have read in the initial strength of materials. You have the hollow section and the solid section. You should know which of this is good in uh, twisting and because you have torsional and uh, you also know about the moment of inertia of these two. So if you take a look at it, you will get to know that which of it is going to take up uh, much of the loading. Now, similarly, as I said, the length is which is in the denominator, that is, uh, it is going to be squared. So that's more sensitive and that's going to affect the whole uh, load carrying capacity of that particular uh, structure. So you need to know this. In short, you should know that if it is a short column, if it is being subject to some type of loading, it could be any type of frame, it is subject to some type of loading, you divide by A, that is uh, force by area is going to give you the stresses and that you will find, you will compare with that of the members or the materials allowable stresses if it is within that it is safe when it comes to the long compressive members you are supposed to take the critical oilers critical uh, loading and then you need to find the critical stresses also in order to find whether it is a system is safe or not so that's the very important uh, thing that you should know whenever it comes to the long columns now this is a summary of taking uh, when to take for the short column you should know that whenever you design a column it needs property that is the buckling also so you need to take these two into account and you know the, the when you apply a load and that's the area of it and you know the length and you take the uh, length characteristics and then you find uh, the buckling characteristics and you can easily find at what point is going to fail and if you see that though the material has not reached uh, to the fullest capacity still the material the, the system is going to fail because of buckling so this is an important uh, step that you should always be aware of and you should know the definitions of these critical loads whether it is in stable or unstable equilibrium i'll just uh, run through this you'll get to know here you, we just spoke about uh, this the bifurcation point and you spoke about the unstable equilibrium the neutral equilibrium and uh, stable equilibrium you see that whenever the load that is applied onto a column and if it is less than the critical you can say that this particular system is in stable equilibrium i said that when i induce energy into the system the system is going to get into some change change and this energy is not going to disturb the system in such a way that uh, it is going to disturb its original position but it is going to get back to its original position after being released so thereby such a system is called a uh, system in stable equilibrium so this is the concept that is applied onto a column you can see the same analogies here you push the ball it gets back the same thing that means i induce the load onto it the, uh, the energy into it the energy is going to disturb the system the system when it is disturbed off once it, then it, this is released it gets back to its normal uh, equilibrium condition then this load is less than the critical thereby this system is in stable equilibrium when you take up this particular system you can see that when it is disturbed if the loading is quite higher than the critical loading so then the whole system is beyond uh, its carrying load carrying capacity or it undergoes unstable equilibrium thereby it fails by buckling so you can see that because of the forces acting uniaxial there is a buckling failure and this is called unstable or uh, disturbed condition. 
Now, there will be a point wherein you put the load, but it will be exactly at the point wherein you know, it will uh, try to be critical. So that's the point that we are dealing with in ULS color buckling. That means you apply the load. At one point, it, the more you apply a little much than this, it's going to fail. And that is the bifurcation point we are talking about. And that is uh, at that point, you're trying to say that you are in stable equilibrium or neutral equilibrium. Now, if in case I extend this lecture for maybe more hours, you may not be in uh, maybe uh, after one hour you come to this neutral equilibrium and uh, you, you are in the critical time. Maybe if I go on presenting beyond this, I think you will fall into the unstable equilibrium. So I think the point at which you cannot tolerate after that is called the critical uh, or the critical point or the bifurcation point or the state is called as neutral equilibrium state. That means you just you just add, you don't add much of the energy into the system because the system has en enough and if you add a little much, it will fall into the different categories that is unstable equilibrium. So that's the example of it. And uh, when it comes to the real structure, it is not going to be exactly behaving the same way, though the oil is dead when, he, when it is loaded and it is uh, when it is uh, uh, when it is subjected to uniaxial force and there is a loading. He, he said that, you know, it's going to be exactly behaving um, uh, like in the stable equilibrium. That will never happen. Uh, that is neutral equilibrium. It will never happen. Uh, but uh, in reality, it is going to be different. So you can see that the critical buckling is given here and the action load that has been subjected and the amount of buckling that takes place. So in case of the perfect uh, column, you see that it's going to be different when it comes to the uh, the other, uh, uh, the actual or the real structures, you see there is going to be a lot of factors or the uh, imperfection and the end conditions and material behaviors, all those things coming to play and the, uh, the behavior is going to be quite different. Now, whenever you see the equation that we learned, that is pi square EI by L square, that is the Euler's buckling formula, there will be always a question that is asked, you know, derive the equation for it. It's quite simple derivation. I'll not run through it uh, because there are two types of ways of doing, but I want to emphasize why it is done. So you take a linear element. Uh, if I, by saying linear element, I mean to say that L is much, much greater than B and H. That means the cross-sectional properties of it. So that is called, the, that is called the slender structure or the one dimensional structure, the long structure. So you subject that to uniaxial uh, uni actual compression only and that too at the centroidal axis as per the Euler's um, assumption and the length of it is given by L. So once it has been subjected, you know because of this one condition being fixed or one condition being hinged, the other condition being pressed. So you know that because the, there is one particular point, it will give away and it will start uh, buckling. So it's not going to bend, but it's going to buckle. Okay. So then you know that this can be easily related to the second differential equation because because the stresses that is induced within this column, it is almost uh, like that of the bending equation and the relation because of the curvature relation with the moment. We can easily find that uh, d square y by dx square is uh, can be equated to the uh, equation that is m uh, that is bending moment and ei. So though the system has been buckled, we can relate it to that equation equation and thereby get to our derivation. So you can see that because of the force that is applied beyond certain point, the system has buckled and that is uh, that is after buckling, you try to draw the free body diagram. The free body diagram is a diagram wherein you remove all the boundary conditions. You just include the internal forces and the external forces acting on a system and as well as place the coordinate system and all the geometries uh, and other requirement that needs to do uh, that needs to be done uh, that needs to be put for the deriving. So once you take any section, so you can see that the whole system is in equilibrium, whether it is in stable equilibrium, unstable equilibrium or neutral equilibrium, you know that the system is in equilibrium. At any section you cut, that system has to be in equilibrium. Now you know that if I take the forces that is actual forces that is acting and you know the how to represent unknown force. This is unknown force. That's why it is represented like this. So you know that the distance between the, the, uh, the axis from here to here and the forces that is internal forces that is generated at any cross section, that needs to balance. This needs to balance this. So that's how you balance it. You can find the uh, equilibrium equation and by this equilibrium equation you just uh, in place of m that is 
m plus p w that is the uh, easy the equilibrium equation once you get m you know that because it's also closer related to the the bending so thereby you can easily relate to that formula and thereby uh, you can put that formula in place of m and you get the equation and this particular equation is uh, the differential equation so this is the second order differential equations you know that is going to talk about the systems behavior so you know how to solve a differential equation the differential equation is there that means there are various parameters that is varying with respect to uh, the other parameters because we are talking with respect to space that is x so here the variation is with respect to x so i need to assume a parameter such that it fits into the equation keeps the equation in balance so i need to find the solution as you know there is because it's a differential equation there won't be um, multiple uh, solutions to it so that's in most of the textbooks whatever you refer to there are refer to various things don't get confused it's not going to be uh, uh, hampering you much i have assumed here e to the power of uh, lambda x some people question paper the some papers would have assumed as sine some papers would have assumed assumed as sin plus cos some paper would have assumed as sin plus cos plus uh, the other constant like a b c and d so anything whatever they assume ultimately it leads you to the same uh, goal of getting the solution to the uh, problem so here i will skip all those things you basically you plug into the equation here you can see when it is plugged into the equation you get uh, the uh, the the equation wherein you need to find the constant for finding the constant you put the boundary conditions because it's a special problem if it was an initial uh, condition problem that is a dynamic problem you put the initial conditions wherein the velocity and acceleration and displacement come into play whereas when it comes to this, this particular um, uh, this one member then you will take those conditions like deflections and uh, the bending moments and as well as the shear force and then you will uh, try to find which of the conditions going to be satisfied and ultimately you try to find a b c d which are the constant which you assume and ultimately you get the equation that is required that is the euler's uh, buckling equation so it's uh, you can uh, you can go ahead and uh, check out some textbooks i have done uh, been i'm just running through the slide because i just wanted to emphasize on the and there is one more uh, which is a derivation which i pulled out from uh, some net and uh, you can see here it's very simple that you have the same rod and uh, what i want to emphasize here is you know till this point it's quite simple as you all know the moment is going to be equated to the second differential equation and you should know why this is equated you, because there is a because Uh, the moment is related to the radius of curvature do you know the curvature is uh, though because we are dealing with small deflection theory that's why it is d square y by dx square so i will not explain all the things in detail i'll just uh, leave it here uh, because we are dealing with small deflection theory the bending moment is equated to the uh, the curvature d square y by dx square and this is the equation that you can easily find and that's the but if you look at the solution here you can see that the solution can be assumed to be of the this kind and then you go on differentiating and uh, various books gives you various uh, uh, solutions and ultimately the final results is going to be the same so it is all your assumption the way you assume things so i have just uh, kept these uh, derivations for you on the slide so that uh, when you refer to this uh, presentation or when you refer to this uh, particular uh, video i think we should be able to uh, understand these things so any textbooks gives you uh, various uh, solutions but look at the solution here now if i have the solution you have the solution wherein uh, because it's a differential equation you won't have a single solution you will have multiple solutions so the solution at where the cos theta is zero the first condition you get is pi by 2 uh, if i put plug in in this equation of pi by 2 you get zero so that should be one of the solution the second solution is going to be 3 by 2 then 5 by 2 now if i uh, most of the textbook what they do they just give you a problem wherein you just plug in this pi by 2 and get the solution now what if i plug in this is the next question that means if i plug in this i get the first mode of failure this is the second mode of failure this is the third mode of failure so basically uh, when uh, in the textbooks if in case some people are referring to the textbook wherein they assume this as well as this and this that means they are looking for three type, three modes of failure if i just assuming one no they are only concerned with one mode of failure so irrespective of whatever you do i think uh, for your uh, engineering i think uh, the one mode of failure is sufficient as i said when we when euler's uh, derived the uh, equation that is euler's uh, critical buckling uh, equation he derived for various uh, beam conditions okay but initially it uh, that was derived for the pin pin condition now if you look at the pin pin condition the length the effective length which is going to be effective very important is the word effective okay so now what you see is basically here 
the the what you see this uh, the it is going to buckle right the whole system is buckling so if in case you put it in loose words you say it is bent uh, but because of the action force that is acting you can see that the system is buckled now if you see this buckling is happening at certain points and the points of inflations so you know what is the point of inflations where there is going to be the stress reversal taking place so if you look at the system that is being buckled you can see at what certain points within the member there is a point of inflation that means there is a change of its stresses so that is the point that is very important for us and the point of inflations uh, between the point of inflations the distance between that is called the effective length the effective length talks about how well the stresses are being distributed it is most of the time it is misunderstood that uh, the distance between these uh, is nothing but the uh, the bending moment it's not so it is which is the uh, the effective uh, length is talking about the way that uh, the stresses is being distributed when the system is being buckled okay so that's very important so the effective length of the pin pin is uh, is equal to l uh, if in case you take the fixed condition and you, the conditions of the, the boundaries can vary okay it's uh, we are not i'm not going to get into that uh, boundary conditions because you need to know that uh, some, sometimes it can get into the translation, horizontal translation, the vertical translation both and it could be also rotational. So the, the hinge conditions uh, provides a lot of uh, degrees of freedom. You should know which of the conditions will provide you that. So you have pin condition, fixed condition and you have the fixed and free condition and the pin and fixed uh, condition. So if you look at this, the fixed and the fixed condition, you can see that the effective length is L by 2 whereas when it comes to fixed and free condition, the effective length is two times of L, then when it comes to the pin and the, uh, the fixed, it is going to be 0 0.7 times of L. So you have various end constraints and that, as I said, in Euler's equation, you have uh, the equation pi square EI by L square. So you know the L is very, very sensitive parameter and you know the end condition is going to change the sensitivity of the whole the system itself. So the boundary conditions are very, very important. So now, if you can see, the most of the textbooks would have done for the pin-pin condition and you know that you have certain parameters that you multiply here to get the buckling equation and this buckling uh, most of the time for various other condition is expressed as a multiple of uh, the condition of both end pin condition. That means you have a low, this particular equation when the both end is fixed, uh, both end is pinned. Now, for this, there is going to be a multiplier. So the buckling load for various other condition is expressed as a multiple of both end spin conditions. So you just have to multiply with certain factors to get it. So if you look at the table, this talks about the end condition and the generalized formula that is given by the Heulers uh, based on this assumption. This is talking about the effective length, the distribution of the stresses along the member when it is subject to the buckling and it depends on the point of inflations. And then this is talking about the Euler's shape function that uh, that is going to take uh, place uh, because of this uh, bucket. So this is what um uh, you should know and uh, I think it's given in the textbook. So next, the buckling stress. Now, what does the buckling stress depend on? So you know, you know that the buckling stress depends on modulus of elasticity, the length of the column and the dimensions of the column. So very important is the dimension is uh, something to do with uh, the radius of gyration. We'll talk about it and as well as the, uh, the slenderness ratio. Okay, now the radius of gyration, you should know that the radius of gyration expresses the relationship between the area of cross section and this introidal moment of inertia. Okay, so basically, this is a shape factor that measures the resistance to buckling about an axis. So, you should know that the radius of gyration is very, very important. The radius of gyration of a cross section is basically defined uh, that distance from its moment of inertia at which the entire area could be considered as being concentrated without changing its moment of inertia. That's the basic definition that you would have learned from books. So, but some people know this uh, radius of gyration as root of I by A, but this is a very important factor that affects the column and that uh, is also going to affect the slenderness ratio that is uh, and as well as the we, that we have the boundary condition also. So thereby the buckling stress depends on the dimensional cross-section area. That means we are talking about the slenderness ratio and as well as the boundary conditions. The, since uh, the, the loading, the critical loading divided by the area gives you the stress. So you have that uh, related here. You can see here you are trying to find 
uh, the uh, buckling stresses and buckling load. When you have a buckling load, you divide by area, you get the buckling stress. And if you are trying to find the stresses, we are relating that to the the radius of gyration. You can see that the uh, we can easily make out that L by R G is nothing but radius of gyration. So you try to find uh, from this formula, you can get that uh, the buckling stresses can be determined by using this particular formula. And important parameter in the Euler's formula is the one which I said that is L by R G that is length effective length by radius of gyration which is called the slenderness ratio that is defined as the effective length of the column to the minimum radius of gyration of the cross sectional end of the column so that's very important that you should know and the length uh, the effective length is dependent on the column length the entire column length and the support condition which we spoke about between which between the end supports the column is going to have the effective length because of the stress distribution as i said between its point of contralecture and the radius of gyration because it's a parameter it's a shape function you can see how best the moment of inertia is being utilized by the material and uh, which of the uh, because we are taking the minimum radius of gyration so thereby the failure is going to take place in that direction so that's very important and if you can see uh, the you can see that for various conditions you can see that uh, the buckling uh, equation is going to change because of the support condition and this is also one of one among the major factors that is going to contribute to the column uh, column uh, that failure that is buckling failure that is the effective length with that so if you take an example if in case you are going to go through some examples uh, you can read some textbooks uh, you can easily make out but here i would like to emphasize this is a circular rod with both end pinned we have both end pinned okay so if in case i have both end pinned pinned now i get to know the radius of gyration you get that and the slenderness ratio you can easily find out the buckling so th that's how you find the buckling now why is that required now if you take now you need to understand the, how the effective length would uh, definitely affect the load carrying capacity. Now, what do you mean by that? If you have a column that has been fixed at both ends, you know what it physically means? Uh, it means that the column dimension is going to perform as if it was half of the length. That means if you have two of the uh, uh, end supports to be fixed, that means you assume that column to be half of the height and the load carrying capacity is going to get enhanced almost about four times. That's very, very important. So you have to know that the end condition uh, it really matters on the load carrying capacity of it and its performance also. So to re-emphasize again, if in case you have a column fixed on both ends, you, that means the performance of the column is affected by the, col the column is going to behave as if the column is half of its height and its capacity of load carrying capacity is enhanced four times of it. Now you take the similar case or uh, that wherein the condition is going to be different. You have the column that is fixed on one end and free on the other end like a flag post here you know how it is going to behave this is going to behave as a column that is that is going to perform uh, which has got a two times of h and their load carrying capacity is one fourth of h uh, one fourth that means if i increase the if i in, if i change the boundary condition by just by mere changing of boundary condition the system is going to behave very differently you can see that the boundary condition that is the pin and the fixed enhance the length thereby the sensitive it makes the load carrying capacity it reduces its load carrying capacity because the length is a sensitive parameter the load carrying capacity almost drastically reduced one fourth of it so you can see that if i make it fixed what is going to happen if i make it free what is going to happen so this is very important when you are looking at the oilers uh, buckling so similarly you have various columns so you have the slender column intermediate column we just spoke about the short column and the uh, long column that is the slender column in between you have the intermediate columns and we also spoke about the um, the buckling stresses so i have not uh, just to cut short uh, because of time i will just uh, conclude in two more slides so if the critical stress uh, you just take uh, this this is a buckling curve basically this is a buckling curve wherein you, what you see here dotted is nothing but what is given by the euler's uh, curve that's called the euler's curve Okay, so this is the uh, in reality by experiments what we have got. So you can see here on the x axis, you have the slenderness ratios. You can see the slenderness ratios. In the slenderness ratios, you can see that it's going to be minimal for shortest column, the intermediate column in between the long column here. Now on the y axis, you see the load carrying capacity of it or the critical stresses of it. Now if this P by A, now you can see here, here you get the stresses 
then you can see here there is going to be one more here and there is going to be ultimate here. So you have these many uh, uh, points that you have defined. Now you can see that the slender column has got the fullest capacity. That means the full material can be utilized. Whereas when it comes to the slender uh, column, you can see even if they, uh, though there is an ultimate capacity of it, the strength is going to be more, but still it is going to be deficient. Thereby, you are going to design this for the buckling first, and it is going to be uh, like that. And then if you look at the long column, you can see that this particular column, there is no factor for strength, but it's going to fail by buckling. The, that means that two design criteria for column are that they do not buckle and the strength is not exceeded. Uh, depending on the slenderness, one um, uh, we will uh, no, we can control over the other. That means we need to control either the strength or the uh, buckling. So, in but in reality, there is nothing perfect. Okay, there is nothing perfect. The columns will not actually be loaded concentrically, uh, but will be eccentric. And uh, well, as you all know, Euler's formula is only applicable if the critical stress is uh, less than the half of the yield uh, point stresses. So you will understand that when you are doing when you are going with the derivations. Now, I just wanted to emphasize you know, how this is going to um, uh, behave. So if you see here, when during the experimentation, they found uh, this to be uh, pa uh, taking the path of the blue line, and by, whereas the Euler formula, uh, uh, formula, which takes into account various assumptions, falls into this category, and which sometimes uh, for this intermediate and the long column, you can see that it is applicable for the long column, whereas when it comes to the intermediate and the, uh, this one, the short column, it doesn't uh, take into various factors, and this, this is applicable only for the long columns. Thereby, you can see that Euler was the right person, you know, the, for the first person was, uh, I mean, who gave us the uh, buckling for the longer column. So I am not getting into details of this because of shortage of time. Uh, I think uh, I will just show you a few slides of the column failure that we see in civil engineering, why we emphasize so much on the load carrying capacity of a column. And as I said, the stability is not applicable only for the column as such, but it is. it should be, it's, uh, it's uh, because of the limitation of your syllabus, it is applicable or it is only emphasized to the columns. So in civil engineering, we see that the crushing here, you can see here, uh, there is one more failure here, and you can see the, uh, the column failure here because of the crushing, because of short uh, column effect. You can see this is also short column effect uh, that has happened, uh, that is crushing. You can see the crushing here and uh, the crushing uh, uh, happening at various points. You can also see there is uh, other uh, mixed modes, but uh, this could be because of various reasons. You can see, and uh, I will also show you some of the buckling uh, of uh, the, uh, the structures. You can see here, this is going to be buckling. So you can see some of the uh, points that you can see the buckling failures. So in civil engineering, we have various cases because we are dealing with concrete structures. Uh, most of them don't know how these failures will occur. And in, when they are designing using the code books, they only know that they need to use the formula rather than understand why this formula has come in picture and how this is being progressively put into the formulas or how the parameters have got into the formula slow and study after Euler. So most of them don't, don't know much because uh, they don't have the feel of the structure. So understanding this failure is the first uh, step towards becoming a good engineer. So I thank you one and all for your kind patience and I thank you for the department for allowing me to speak for uh, such a uh, long time and uh, addressing this uh, um, is mechanical department. If there is any questions, I'm ready to answer. And uh, if the, I'm sorry if in case I've extended my time and if it was uh, not, um, I mean, um, my eloquence was not uh, understandable by a few of them. I thank you one and all. Uh, any questions, I'm able to, uh, I'll be able to answer those. And what are the limitations of this working? Okay, uh, the limitations, uh, if you look at the assumptions, uh, I think uh, if you, Look at the assumption itself that talks about the limitations. So most of the uh, limitations are, you know, as you know, the real uh, structure, when it will take into layer structure, there's never concentric. The loading is never concentric and it has to pass to the neutral axis. So uh, that is the limitations of it. And you know that is uh, the, it is not applicable for, I mean, it's not, it fails uh, in certain uh, uh, cases. So that could be the limitations also. questions please dear students you can ask the questions we have no questions 
Krishant, you are not getting your voice. Hello. Hmm? no questions, sir. Yeah, okay, can we get at least some feedback, please? Uh, yes. Guys? Right. Yeah, yeah, Guna Shekhar. Guna Shekhar, go ahead. So it was very informative. Yes, and uh, every day explanation. So it was a really interesting topic to learn about. So thank you. Thank you. Yachka, Nishai, Vamshi, Vamshitam, Awasai Pranav, Yaroji, go ahead. Sir, it was very informative, sir. Thanks for the. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, Dr. Chandra Mauri, sir. On behalf of Mechanical Engineering Department, PS University, we thank you, sir. We invite our uh, invitation for the guest lecture with your BG schedule. Over the last about two hours, we have had a deep insight of strength of material approach and theory of material theory of elasticity, particularly in the Euler's buckling column load or Euler's buckling column theory. And you made us very clear the importance of the strength, stiffness, stability for design perspective of designing uh, any structure or machine element. And you give a you gave a brief introduction about uh, damage and strength theory, particularly in damage, brittle failure, and plastic failure. You made us a very clear uh, distinguish between the brittle failure and uh, plastic failure. And the lecture on the stiffness is very well, sir. The st uh, static dif uh, stiffness and the dynamic stiffness. And also you sh the tensile test, how actually we conduct the tensile test, uh, what is the nature of the stress tensor we get, and what are the neck reasons. You made us very clear about that, sir. And most of the students uh, have still confusion whether the resilience is a material property or not. You made us very clear about that the difference between the resilience and toughness, what are the areas between that elastic zone and up to the fracture zone, which area we need to consider for measurement of the resilience and toughness, and also the brittle fracture and ductile fracture or ductile failure, and also the stress strain curve for different materials. And coming to the main agenda of that is the stability of column, so who introduced that uh, first time, that's the stability concept. It's the Euler. And you made us very clear about the what is meant by equilibrium stable, what is meant by equilibrium unstable, and what is meant by equilibrium neutral. Of course, we have this uh, uh, in our uh, syllabus also, sir, in unit number five. And the major difference between the short column and long column which load we are supposed to calculate, which load we are supposed to use for calculating the stability of the long column and the short column. And also the little bit of uh, the, diff the derivation part of the PCR, that is the Euler's column buckling load. And you made us very clear about the, how actually the buckling will happen with the live example. Uh, that is a very well and very informative, sir. With this, your, uh, once again, I express my sincere thanks to you, sir, on behalf of our Department of Mechanical Engineering. 
and also i am thankful for our to our hod sir for giving me this chance to organize this guest lecture and i also thanks for the teaching and non teaching and technical staff for arranging this guest lecture through the microsoft teams and thanks one and all thank you sir thank you thank you mr mantish thank you thank you